Brother Scott, thank you. Me. Lord, <laughs> I need you. And thank you that you're not just redeeming me, you're redeeming a people. And those people gather in local congregations all over the world. And our song today is that we need you, Lord. We, we come here today, all of us in different places. And we say to you that we need you because apart from you, Jesus, you said you could do nothing. And I think of what Peter said, where else will we go? So, Lord, we're here today gathered in your name, in your righteousness, in your redemption, saying not only do we need you, but the gospel rem reminds us that we have all we need. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We have what we need in you, Jesus. And so to that end, will you, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us now to hear the word and that the word of God would lead us to you, the God of the word, and equip us to do the missional work of God. That's to make disciples, to preach the gospel. So help us now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for the opportunity to come back. I'm excited. It's a privilege to be here. Well, I want to begin by asking you, it's title, Do You Get It? Maybe, it, you know, and I, I contemplated on whether or not to, to use the pronoun you, but I, 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 think, I think do we get it? Do I get it? And in light of what we just sang, do we get it? Do we get it? Now, if you're asking, well, what is it am I supposed to get, stay with me, and maybe we'll unpack that. Well, what comes to your mind when you hear the word partnership? What comes to your mind? Think about it for a moment. When you hear the word partnership, what comes to your mind? Did, for example, did this... Did Red Bull and Spotify come to your mind? <laughs> or GoPro, excuse me. GoPro and Red Bull. What about Uber and Spotify? Did you know that if you call an Uber, get an Uber, that Spotify has teamed up with Uber and you can, you can play whatever playlist on, on Spotify while you're Ubering? Did y'all know that? Maybe y'all knew that. I, I didn't know that. I don't take many Ubers. What about this next one, West Elm and Casper? Anybody ever visit a West Elm store or gone online? West Elm and Casper. Casper, they provide mattresses. They've partnered. They've teamed up. Or what about, let me give you one more, BMW and Louis Vuitton. They've partnered. They have things in common. All of these that I showed you were basically business partnerships within the past seven or eight years. But I want to ask you a deeper question. What comes to your mind when you hear the word gospel partnerships? When you hear the word gospel partnerships, just think for a moment. What comes to your mind? And maybe what are some of the characteristics that would portray a gospel partnership? What does it look like? What does a gospel partnership look like? Well, in our passage for today, we're going to see what a admirable gospel partnership looks like. And more importantly, we're going to see what an admirable church that partners in the gospel looks like. Because at the end of the day, what does convergence want to be? What do we want to be? Do we want to be a church that just kind of puts along? Do we want to be a church that's comfortable? When it comes to partnerships, do we want to be defined by what we think partnerships should look like? Or do we want to be the type of church that its partnerships with others is biblical? So 
Today, we're going to talk about finances some. Now, I just want to say this to you. My goal in today is not to share my opinions. I want to share what God has to say. So that removes, when it, you know, money can be a little touchy. You guys all know that. But that, that removes the barrier for me because I'm not telling you my words. I'm telling you God's words. And then it also takes the onus, I mean, in the sense of, you're not looking at me, you know, I don't want you to be offended by maybe what I would say, because what I'm saying is from the Lord. So, so what type of church do we want to be when it comes to gospel partnerships? And I think the Bible has a lot, a lot to say that. Well the, go- well, the gospel came to this church in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. You guys probably remember this. It came through this gentleman by the name of the Apostle Paul, and he had a protege that was coming with him, and perhaps Luke was also there and some others. But it came to this little place in Philippi. They were, they were wanting to go to a place to pray, and then they find this like, like river. Paul and Timothy, they go by this river, and they kind of start inquiring to these ladies that were down by the river. And next thing you know, they share the gospel with them. You see, when the gospel goes forth, it begins to change things. I want you to just think about this for a moment. Why are most of us here? It's because the gospel came to us. And then the gospel began to work in us. And then now the gospel is working through us. So the gospel came to this little this little Roman colony in, in Philippi. And the gospel was presented. And then th- these ladies started to be changed. And so one of them said, look, I need to be baptized now. I understand that Jesus Christ came to live the life that I could not live. And he died in my place and for my sins so I can be reconciled to this wonderful father. And he was raised from the dead three days, and I understand that, and now I want to give my life to him. What did, what did Lydia do? What did, what did Lydia do with even her whole family? She said, you know what she said? She said, come use my house for the gospel. Lydia was a, was a trader. She, she was fairly wealthy. She was a business owner, but the gospel came, and it began to change her. And then the next thing you know, the gospel moved from there, and then there was this like demon-possessed girl and she, and she was following Paul and, and Timothy along. And finally, Paul got tired of it. And he just said, come out of her. And her life was changed. And people got mad because they were using this girl to kind of gain a profit. And so they put Paul and Timothy in jail. And so they're in jail and they're singing hymns. And next thing you know, there's this earthquake. This earthquake happens and then... And then all the prisoners were, were their, their cells were open and, and, and the, the, the prison guard was like, oh my goodness, because he, he thought that, that they were going to escape and he was going to be killed for that. But instead, Paul said, no, 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 calm down. We're here. But let me tell you why it happened. It happened so you can know this Jesus. And so the gospel changed him. And before Paul and Timothy were thrown in prison, they were beaten. And so what does this, what does this prisoner or this, this guard do? What does he do? He, he, he takes Paul and Timothy and they wash their wounds. Somebody that was opposed to the gospel that was for Rome was now washing the wounds of these messengers of the gospel. And then the gospel goes to his house and everybody in his house gets saved. And they get baptized. See, the gospel changes everything. And when we talk about the passage today, the gospel changes the way we view our stuff. See, before we became Christians, our stuff was our stuff. We sat at the center of our life. And our father was our creator, our maker. When the gospel came to us and it began to work in us, The way it works through us is we no longer see our stuff as our stuff. It's God's stuff. 
And so the gospel came to this little church. And this little church was changed forever. It was, it was birthed, and then it was changed forever. And this little church was unlike probably any other church that was, that was planted by the Apostle Paul and Timothy. And so this, this, this little church is going to show us of what a gospel partnership it should involve. And I'll be quick. So number one, here's what a gospel partnership should involve, okay? Here's what it, here's what it should involve. Number one, if you would skip a few slides and, and I'll read the verses. But it should involve, number one, it should involve partners. Okay, it should involve partners. Listen to verse 14 and 15 of chapter 4 of Philippians. It says this. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me. Paul here is closing this letter and he picks back up off of the theme or off of verse 10 where he was basically rejoicing in the Lord and in the Philippians' contribution to his needs. He's picking back up. And so in verses 14 and 15, here's what he does. He uses these words, share and partnership. These are critical words. These are key words when you look at this passage. And he says that, that it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And that no church entered into partnership with him except them. As I, as I read these, you probably are thinking back maybe to chapter 1. Listen to what chapter 1 verse 3 and 5 said. He starts his letter off this way. He says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you. Uh, making prayer with joy. And then he says this in verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel. Where am I going with this? Paul viewed the Philippian church as partners. And, and hear me, partners were not just business ventures. Partners were something special. In the original, the root word for these words, share and partnership, is this word koinonia. And it, it means to fellowship. It means to deeply fellowship. It means to participate. It means to, to share in something that you have in common. It means, to com it means communion. It's found, in essence, 20 times in the New Testament. And its first occurrence was found in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, verse 42, that you're probably familiar with, where it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, teachings and to the fellowship. You see, koinonia is being in agreement with one another, being united in purpose and serving alongside each other that you'll do whatever it takes. I mean, I, let, me give you a, let me give you an example. Anybody watch the Avengers? The first Avengers? I mean, those superheroes, right? They were about their own thing. Remember, Remember the story? The Hulk was about the Hulk. Captain America was about Captain America. Iron Man was about Iron Man. But something happened in the movie. Things began to change. And at some point, they were like, you know what? This is not just about us anymore. See, when the gospel comes to, comes to our life, we go, it's not about me anymore. And it wasn't about them anymore. It was about the, the, the fellowship. It was about the, the purpose. And so Paul here is saying, look, you shared in my trouble. I thank God for our partnership. It was, it was something special. And so a church that understands gospel partnerships understands what it means to partner. I, 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 I'm one with you. I can't leave you. I can't, I can't walk out on you. When you have needs, I do every, whatever I can to meet those needs. There's something special about gospel partnerships. And it means more than just a business venture. It means more than the, than the slides we looked. It means more than BMW and Louis Vuitton getting together to provide some like luxurious stuff. They're just all about money. 
Koinonia is more than that. In church, this is what we're about. We're not, a, we're not just a bunch of individuals in here about, for our, about our own thing. We're about Jesus. And Jesus is creating a people that is displaying his glory. And so the first thing that, that a gospel partnership involves, and especially when it comes to a church, it involves partnership and understanding the second thing it involves is it involves giving remember it let me tell you i'm gonna tell you why we give (laughs) you know it's it's not right for me to just tell us to do something or you know you think of in the church oftentimes i i want to just be told to do something But the why behind what we do is so much more important, I think, than than maybe even what we do. Because God looks at the heart. And listen, when the gospel comes your way, it it changes your identity. Like your identity change. It changes. What you do flows out of who you are. And so, for example, when it comes to money, when, when when I don't spend my money the way God would have me spend it, when I don't give generously... When I don't sacrifice in my giving, guess what? There's a disconnect in my mind. I'm not, I'm not, I'm forgetting who I am in essence. And so gospel partnerships involves a church who gives. Listen to verse 15 and I'll just be brief here. It says, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving. And then verse 18, I have received full payment and and more. I'm well supplied having received From Epaphroditus, the gifts you sent. Knowing church history, many of you do. This was not Paul's first missionary journey. He had planted other churches. He had planted churches that were more wealthy than the Philippian church. But no other church stuck with him. I mean, him and Barnabas were tearing it up. If you read the book of Acts from Acts chapter 13 to about through 15. They planted some great churches. But then they go over to Macedonia because here's this call. And, and, and the one thing you got to know about the Macedonian churches, were, which were basically the Philippian church, the, the, the church of Thessalonica and the church of Berea. They were poor. They were dirt poor. They didn't have anything to give. And so what Paul's doing here is he's now recounting their history. He's, he's thankful and he's, rem, he's remembering their history. And what was their history is that they, they, they gave to Paul when he went to Thessalonica. And they gave more than one time. They gave continually. And then he rolls over to Berea and, and they give to him there. And then now he's in Rome. And this is probably 10 or 11 years later. They're giving to him again. You see, their partnership included giving. And they they gave. They gave for a long time. And they gave deep. They went deep. They went without so that he could have. And you may ask, well, what what, what did they they give him? Well, they they gave him probably, I mean, they gave him money. They gave him food. They gave him clothing. If you know, he was was writing from from a Roman prison, right? And the prison in Rome was, was much different than our prison, right? In our prison, you guys know this, uh, we, we provide you clothes, we provide you food, we provide you sh- shelter of some sort, but not in Rome. That's why he, he would say, and Jonathan did a great job, I mean, he would say, listen, I, nobody was with me, and I had to learn to be content. I didn't have anything. And it wasn't until they sent Epaphroditus that Epaphroditus brought this gift of food and clothing and and money that he would need. You see, a gospel partnership, a church that understands gospel partnerships, listen, we give, we give deep. And that's what this church was. They gave, and they gave deep. So this leads us to our last point. The first was, 
They understood what partnership was all about. It's more than just a business venture. They understood that they had to give and it was going to cost them something. And the last, they understood that, hey, we got to rewire our thinking about economics. Matter of fact, we've got to have a, a kingdom understanding of economics. I say it this way. We have to understand kingdom economics, gospel economics. And here's, here's some of the traits of gospel economics. Ready? Verse 17, Paul says here, not that I seek the gift. He's telling them, I don't, I don't seek the gift that you're giving me. I've learned to be content. Guys, I didn't have anything. And you weren't able to give for whatever reason. But now, I'm content. But I seek the gift now so that your spiritual fruit increases. See, you got to understand that when we give as a church or you give as an indiv individual, you are increasing your spiritual bank account, if I could say it that way. You are investing in not an IRA, but an IEA, right? An, e an eternal account. And that's what he's saying. He, and and, and, and let, me, let me try to connect the dots. Our giving here on earth affects our eternity. Our, our giving here on earth is, is, can I say it this way, paying it forward to spiritual treasure. Jesus talked about spiritual treasure. Don't, don't place your treasure, don't build up your treasure here on earth. No, build up your treasure where? In heaven, where, where rust can't destroy it, where moths can't destroy it, where people can't steal it. And so what's Paul saying here? He said, listen, your continual giving is investing treasure for you. And, don't, and, and hear me, if I'm a financial advisor, I'm going to tell you the truth about investing in monetary things on earth. But I just got to be real with us here. Let's don't miss. You. Our lives on earth are about that big if the, if, if the scale of eternity was like this. I mean, maybe a dot. On the scale, you will live forever in eternity. And Paul says, your investment. I'm seeking your investment because it's going forward with you. So when you give to the Lord's work, church, when, when, when we give to the Lord's work, it's going forward. We're investing in a spiritual treasure. Well, another characteristic is is that it's pleasing to God. Listen to verse, 13, uh, verse 18. It says, I've received full payment. I've received what you got and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. When we give, it is pleasing to God. Paul, Paul starts off using kind of like a business metaphor when he talks about spiritual investing. And then he moves to an Old Testament metaphor. He's trying to illustrate something for us. And what's he trying to illustrate when he uses this Old Testament metaphor? He's trying to basically say primarily, hey, it's pleasing to the Lord. And if you understand Old Testament sacrifices, in the Old Testament, when you, when you brought a sacrifice that was in the prescriptive way, the way God wanted you to, to bring it, it, it was an aroma that was pleasing to God. The sacrifice was for the purpose of the aroma being pleasing. And so when we give as a church and when we give as individuals, listen, it's an aroma to God that is pleasing. I was tempted this morning to bring in some bacon. And I was just going to have some bacon frying up here. Now, I don't know about you, but like on Mondays, it's kind of our family Breakfast, we, we eat breakfast as a family on Monday. And I have to admit that I'm oftentimes not the one in there cooking. I try to sleep in on Mondays. But one of the things that wakes me up is that smell of bacon. 
I mean, just think of how heavenly the smell of bacon is. It's an aroma that's pleasing to me. Or think of any scent that is when you smell it, when you walk. I love to walk. I, walk, I like to go to Bath and Body with my daughter. Now, guys, y'all are probably like, man, this dude. <laughs> but when we walk in Bath and Body, right, and I walk in with my daughter and we're holding hands, when I walk in there, it's like, mmm. It's, it's an aroma. It's, it's, it's pleasing to my senses. But listen, when we give as a church and when you give as an individual, it's pleasing. It's like that smell of bacon. It's like that, that walking into Bath and Body. Understand that. That, listen, today, when you give, God is pleased. Listen, I, I had something happen to me. My son started a job about a month or so ago working at Chick-fil-A. And he worked a month or so, and it takes a while to kind of get, you know, they set up your automatic deposit. And he finally got a couple of his checks. And he asked me one night we were in his bedroom. It's a little over a week ago. He said, he said, Dad, uh, I, I forgot to give this past Sunday, but I want to give. And he said, does our church kind of have a uh, kind of an online giving? And as a father, do you, my heart, my heart exploded with joy. Think about that. I said, yes. I said, get online right now. And I just want y'all to know that, that when you give, your father is very pleased with your giving. That's kingdom economics, y'all. Not only does your fruit increase, but the father is pleased. And I'll hurry. Verse 19 says, and my God will supply all your needs. Listen to the kingdom economics. It doesn't make sense. W what we do is we do cost analysis when we give. I think of the story in Jesus and the, in the, in the, two, the two fish and the five loaves. He goes to his disciples, you know, he's like, you feed all these people. And they're like, all we got is this two fish and five loaves. They did cost analysis. Paul says here to the Philippians, my God will supply all your needs. God sees what you've been doing. And the promise, this is a promise, this is... You know, God's bank account is not like our bank account. God owns it all. He makes the promise and my God will supply all your needs. That's kingdom economics. You, you don't do cost analysis. I mean, to some, to some degree, Paul, Paul says in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, you know, you know he's not, he wasn't asking the Corinthians to, 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 to give something that they didn't have, but to dig deep. My God will supply all your needs. Guys, when we give as a church sacrificially and when we give as individuals sacrificially, the promise is God will provide our needs. And I know some of us are in here. I bet you, I bet you there are probably many in here who are like, man, I can't afford to give. And I want you to know I've been there. And, and not only have I been there, it seems like as I've grown as a Christian, God likes to up... <laughs> He likes to up my percentage to make it to where it's like, it's, it's almost like, I mean, these two pumpkins. It's like, I move up, okay, it's like, okay, God, you want me to get 10%? All right, I'm here. And then God, like, comes up on me. He's like, I want you to give a little bit more. And I'm like, all right, I'll give a little bit more. And he's like, uh, keep giving. And it's like he keeps like, but, 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 but why? My He's pleased when we give. It's not ours anyway. It's for the kingdom. And he promises, I will supply. Somebody probably needs to hear, listen, if you're, if you're wondering, do, can I afford to give? I want to encourage you, start somewhere. And I want to encourage you to give. And trust God for your needs. He promises here. And remember, the Macedonian church had nothing. They were poor. And yet God kept continuing to fill the supply. Lastly, Our giving causes people to worship. Verse 20, Paul says, To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. What happens? He's writing. 
talking about their giving, and then he, he, he burst out into this doxology. A doxology is a praise. He's done this earlier in the book. He does it in chapter 3. Or he, yeah, he does it throughout the book. I'm thinking of Ephesians chapter 3, this, that beautiful doxology where he just burst out. Here, he, he thinks about what God was doing and how they were a church that was exemplary in kingdom economics. And he says, I'll say it this way. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. I mean, it wasn't like to our God. I mean, he just explodes. Well, let me summarize it and I'm done. Here it is. Gospel partnerships involve a church who gets it. And let me ask the question. You know, the church is made up of individuals, right? God sees us collectively, but God also sees us individually, right? We are people he's fashioning, but, but individually, do you get it? Do I get it? And as a church, do we get it? I'm going to pray, and then there's some questions for discussion that will be on our screen. So as we go into this time now, I really want you to discuss what we've talked about. And there's going to be a couple hard questions. But by the power of the Spirit, I want you to just be honest And let's see where the Lord takes us. Lord, now as we go into our time of discussion, will you speak to us and use the body of Christ to help one another? In Jesus' name, amen. Be questions up here. We'll break up with people near you, and let's discuss some of these questions.